Everyone, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Israel Vasquitelli. So, as I think everybody knows, we're in for a huge treat today. We have these amazing folks from Rooster Teeth. And before we have our discussion, uh, for those that are uninitiated, I would like to let you know that not only are they a hugely successful online animation and content company, but they're responsible for some of the most successful online web series, including Ruby. Anybody ever hear of that? <laughs> and the longest running web series online, Red vs. Blue. Woo! So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm full sail welcome to Miles Luna, Jordan Swears, and full sail grad Chris Coquinos. So so I know you folks have amazing and diverse backgrounds. I would love to start off first, if you don't mind, Miles, yeah. and we'll go down the line, giving us a little bit, just a synopsis, into your career path before you were at Rooster Teeth and what your role is today. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my uh, career path started at GameStop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> While well, I was working at college, at, uh, I went to the University of Texas and uh, graduated with a degree in radio, television, film, uh, and was incredibly fortunate to um, uh, get the internship at Rooster Teeth uh, in my last few years of college, and then that rolled straight into a uh, production assistant job at the company. Uh, I was brought on to do Machinima for uh, Red vs. Blue Season 9, um, and then I was in the graphic design department for a little while. I think they just didn't know what to do with me, but they also didn't want to fire me. <laughs> and uh, But eventually, uh, I was able to... Um, uh, be in the right place at the right time and was handed the reins of writing and directing for Red vs. Blue. Uh, from there went on to co-write uh, the series Ruby with my friends uh, Monty and Carrie Shawcross. Uh, and then uh, we started making more shows. There was X-Ray and Vav, there was Camp Camp, there was all so many things. Uh, and uh, I've, I've for the last few years been serving as the head writer of animation uh, for the animation department. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> Golf clap. Uh, my path is extremely different. Uh, I was bored one summer day in 2010 and decided to make uh, an animation or try to teach myself animation. Uh, so I took some podcast audio from the Rooster Teeth podcast and uh, they told this really funny story about an airplane trip they told. And... Uh, uh, decided to animate that and po put it on YouTube, posted on the Rooster Teeth site, and that night uh, Gus, one of the founders of the company, saw it and posted it himself, and uh, pretty much like kind of went viral in the Rooster Teeth community, and uh, so I started making more. Eventually they started paying me to make them, and then I started making them every week, and then they said, why don't you just move to Austin? So I moved to Austin and kept making RTA uh, pretty much by myself weekly for another year and a half or so. And uh, someone had the idea to you know, start a 2D team. So uh, our first show we made was a show called X-Ray and Vav based on these uh, wacky characters that uh, some of our Achievement Hunter guys made. And uh, since I was the only person in the 2D department, they were like, I guess you should direct it. So, uh, <laughs> I learned you know, how to do uh, big boy animation. <laughs> Uh, started basically telling, you know, we've had, we had animators who were working in our 3D department for years come over and help on this project, and I had to tell them what to do when I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, trial by fire, we learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes, and uh, now we have a full team of uh, uh, 10 plus animators, uh, three artists in-house, an art director, uh, our 2D team has grown tremendously fast and expansively, and uh, now we're on season four of our show Camp Camp, uh, which I have been show running since season one, and it's great. And yeah, I basically fell into this somehow. <laughs> this is the short version. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, let's see, for me, I graduated, Full Sail RA grad from 2008, 
So it's been a little while. Um, since then, I stayed in Orlando for way too long. Uh, moved out, or I guess I was at Disney for a little while interning. That was kind of cool. Uh, picked up, decided to move out to Austin, Texas, where I currently live, uh, to start working in games and just post-production in general. Uh, from there, I worked at a company called Game Salad, kind of doing QA and some other things. Um, that was, what was that? He just made a terrible joke about game salad. salad sounds healthy. healthy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to derail you, Chris. No, remember, okay. That was re good. Remember before this when they were like, hey, if you need to make a dumb snide comment, hit yeah. the mute button. <laughs> Push the mute button. You weren't listening. You weren't obviously listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, so from Game Salad, I, uh, I made my way up through the ranks there. I was doing QA for a while, and then um, game design and sound design. I was working on mobile titles there. I shipped 10 mobile titles in my first year there. Uh, shortly thereafter, I was doing some 48-hour film projects, made some friends with a lot of different people who had other opportunities for me. Went to a company called King's Isle Entertainment where I worked on uh, a game called Wizard 101 and another game called Pirate 101. Uh, pretty popular, okay? Oh, pretty popular fans. MML, okay? Oh, cool. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, I was there for a few years. I worked on a lot of really wonderful, you know, different casts and, and creatures and vehicles. And then my skill set uh, kind of was found out by a good friend of mine who was over at Rooster Teeth, David Levy, who's doing, uh, he's a composer there, working on Red vs. Blue for a while, and most recently Genlock, which has been really cool. Um, he thought I'd be a good fit. Sure enough, it worked out. I've been there now for three years. Um, when I started, there was another guy there who left, and I kind of inherited the department, so sounds like a pretty common theme here. <laughs> um, yeah, I inherited right the department. Right. Yeah, right place, right time. I changed things up pretty drastically. I very quickly learned how to mix in 5.1, which was different. <laughs> uh, and since then, I've worked on over 250 episodes worth of content f across all facets of animation. Alongside everything. Yeah, You're everything. A powerhouse. Yeah. yeah, it's been fun. But I have a wonderful team that I work with. Three of the people on my team, or including myself, uh, three quarters of my team are full cell grads, um, RA students, which has been pretty awesome. But yeah, it's been, it's been a wild and crazy ride, and I'm super glad to be here. Yeah. Awesome. I, I love to yeah, give it up. Full cell grad. <laughs> So I, I'd love to maybe, if, if you folks don't mind, maybe start at the beginning of the business model, which essentially was <laughs> the creation of online content, specifically animated content. And that was before, that was streaming before YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so not, you, you get, not streaming. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me about that. You had to yes. download. Yeah, <laughs> roosterteeth.com, or also known as redversusblue.com, uh, started in 2003. Three. We beat you, YouTube. Deal with it. <laughs> um, yes. they, they don't care. They have billions of dollars. <laughs> um, but no, it was uh, back in the day. Uh, you would not stream video, but you would go to the website, you would download it, and you would watch it on like your Windows media player or whatever. Um, I was one of those people back in the day. The first episode of Red vs. Blue I saw was season three, uh, the Beaver Creek episode with Sergeant Caboose. Was, I had no idea what I was... Oh, oh it's God. so good, right? It's so good. <laughs> so much um, chaos. <laughs> uh, but no, yeah, so the, the company was founded uh, by Bertie Burns, Matt Holm, Gus Sorolla, uh, Jeff. and Jeff Ramsey. Thank you. I was like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> um, but really, it was, um, it was a few guys that really saw what was about to happen, which was that the internet was going to absolutely change everything, particularly the way that we are able to deliver content to viewers. Um, the middleman was gone. Like you didn't have to go out to Hollywood and have like, you know, a big studio give you funding and green line stuff. It's like if you were kind of tech savvy and knew how to deal with websites and, and stuff like that, like you could just put it out there and if people found it and they liked it, then they would come back for it. And they did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they always tell the story about how they they uploaded like the first episode of Red vs. Blue onto the website using like their work servers. Yeah. Whatever. They made a little uh, they made a sound. Um, essentially they, they decided, hey, you know what, let's put a donate button. Um, they beat Patreon too. <laughs> They're like, let's make a donate button on the site. It's like if you want to give us some money, you can you can sponsor us and you can you can donate some money. And 
Uh, they thought it'd be funny if it made a little cash register, register sound every time somebody did it. And they all went to lunch. And then when they came back, there was a bunch of people crowded around the cubicle. And they're like, oh, uh, what's going on? And everyone's like, we don't understand, but your computer keeps making this cha-ching sound <laughs> over and over and over and over and over again. And that's when they realized maybe they shouldn't host this thing from the work computers. <laughs> so they don't get fired. Um, but no, essentially, uh, it was just that kind of understanding of where things were heading before everybody else did and being really quick there. It was almost like the gold rush of the internet of mm -hmm. like, yeah. can you establish yourself fast? Because now, you know, with YouTube and, and, and Twitch and so many other things, there's a constant, there's too much content. It is impossible to watch all of the content that has been uploaded to YouTube. It's physically impossible. So it's really easy to get lost in all of that noise. Fortunately, they were, they were there really, really early on. Yeah. And they, they learned very quickly that, um, uh, in engaging with your community, they, they built a community function uh, to the website where people, like-minded people could come and they'd watch the episodes and talk about the episodes in a forum. Um, they learned very quickly from homestarrunner.com yep, that uh, t-shirts make money. Yep. Uh, and so they quickly started putting uh, sassy quotes on black tees and sold bajillions of those. And uh, then going to conventions. Um, people think that we make a lot of money at conventions. You really don't. It's really more of just like getting word out and, and self-promoting and you sell t-shirts just to kind of cover the cost of being there. <laughs> um, but that was, that was really, a lot of it was realizing that, hey, we have something that people seem to like. We need to give them a way to see it. And then we need to try and give them opportunities to support us, whether that be through uh, merchandise, through supporting us through our sponsorship, which is now called Rooster Teeth First. Um, and then, of course, uh, starting to roll like ads on, on the site and, and things like that. Yeah. As well as, uh, I think you, maybe you beat Netflix, because you were also doing a subscription to your streaming on your site, right? Yes. So yeah. uh, it, it now it's it's been through a few changes over the years. It used to be called being a Rooster Teeth sponsor, but then that was confusing for like sponsors like <laughs> MeUndies and stuff like that. Yeah. So then it was like um, so yeah. Then they changed it to first. Uh, but essentially, what we kind of do is uh, if you, if you are a part of our subscription model, which is only like a couple bucks a month, um, it gives you access to like uh, mobile apps, apps on the Xbox. Um, you can also a, a lot of our shows, you know, because of the name First, we have a, a first window. We're like, hey, you can see this episode one week before it's released to the public. Some of our shows are first exclusive. We also have like behind the scenes content. Um, really, it's, it's, it's a fan club and, and it's, we want to try and provide some sort of additional service as a way to say, hey, thank you for supporting us because you're how we got to where we are now. Slight, slight tangent, one of the perks very early on when you still had to download the videos was HD downloads. Yeah. So. Could you imagine? Yeah. I didn't have you the speed for that. 2003? Yeah. Oh boy, that's Seven, 720p. 999 days to download. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the business. So obviously you started out with video, I'm assuming, as being the main source of initial revenue, actually the consumption of video, uh, directly monetizing that through your uh, users. And then obviously with YouTube, it's, you know, for the most part, it's an advertising business, not to mention all the ancillary business that a lot of media companies have uh, off, offline, which is clearly selling merchant. I saw that you have action figures and video games. Am I missing something? Podcasts. <laughs> Board games. Do it, uh, do it all, man. Uh, yeah. You got a lot, man. Just do it all. Events, live events. <laughs> live events. Yeah. And the um, RTX. Yeah, I was going to say it's the mantra of the company. We just do everything yeah. <laughs> and something works out. Right? <laughs> Would, would you be able to share, uh, maybe not only numbers, but as far as the, the share of revenue from that aspect of the business, would it be still advertising because you're so prominent on YouTube? Is it something that happens on your website, licensing? So before I answer this question, I'd like to remind everybody viewing that I'm a writer and not a <laughs> businessman. So don't. Super quote me on some of this okay. stuff. Um, Just think, only regular quote him on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, regular quotes only. Um, so I think a lot of people assume that we probably make a lot of money off of our YouTube videos, and that's not the case. We primarily, at this point, because Lord knows YouTube has been through a lot of changes over the years, mm -hmm. um, at this point, YouTube is not... Uh, a sustainable enough like model to like we don't make a profit on you mm -hmm. we just don't mm -hmm. um, really uh, it's our, our first membership our own merchandise and then like advertising that we advertisements that we have on our site um, that is what's able to help us out a lot um, YouTube at this point is really 
more of just promotion. It's, we refer to it as top of funnel content of something that maybe YouTube's insane algorithm might suggest to you if you like certain videos. Maybe you watch, like Rooster Teeth Animated Adventures mm -hmm. is one that we refer to all the time. You don't necessarily yeah. have to know everything about Rooster Teeth or who everyone is. It's just a funny story with some really, really funny visuals and, and animations. Mm -hmm. And if you like that, and then maybe you watch a little more, then you'll ask yourself, oh, well, what's Rooster Teeth? And the hope is if you see something on YouTube that catches your eye, hopefully you'll be invested enough to then check Check out more on the Rooster Teeth website. That's the bottom of the funnel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so a lot of times the goal is to try and direct people back to the website right. because as as you know, with YouTube and the adpocalypse and stuff, just as a recent example, mm -hmm. the online um, ecosystem is constantly evolving, and if you don't have control of um, your own home base, essentially, mm -hmm. you know the change in how an algorithm works can ruin you. Like YouTube is not kind to animators. YouTube oh. algorithms these days tend to favor amount of time watched. And that's yeah. just not feasible. You can't compete against people that can turn on their iPhone and record something really funny about chicken McNuggets. I don't know why I chose that. <laughs> chicken McNuggets. Um, and you can't, you can't compete going with, with like, can I eat 50 McNuggets in 60 <laughs> seconds? Ah, like you just can't do that when you're drawing 24 frames every second. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, if we had, if, if we had never made roosteeth.com and just relied solely on uh, platforms like YouTube, or for a while we were making Vines, but hey, Vine ain't around anymore. Mm -hmm, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. there's yeah, not... what happened to all those Vine stars? <laughs> yeah, now they went to TikTok. They went to TikTok <laughs> and Which we'll Disney. die in about. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's, it's, I think um, the, the founders thought, yeah. were really, uh, really smart in, in, in creating their own website and always trying to direct everything back to the website because at the end of the day, that's still something that we can control yeah. and- um, It's know, home. Yeah, it's home. Yeah. We have a home that we can return to. And, the, and, and that's, it, it really is a balancing act because everyone, especially now, is so trained to go to that social space and not to the home base of the company. So I would imagine that poses challenges. It's an extraordinary challenge. Yeah. Uh, so our social pages kind of work the same way as the YouTube channel. It is kind of like the top of the funnel thing to kind of like give you a little tease of a clip or something to go watch it on the website right. if you want to see the rest of it. So yeah, everything kind of just drives towards the website. Yeah. So with, with comedy right. and sci-fi animation, and you, you have so many different forms of media entertainment that Rooster Teeth is bringing to the table, clearly there's a common thread, right, in your community. If you could talk a little bit about what that common thread is uh, for your fans that, you know, might necessarily, might come in maybe as a fan of Ruby and then uh, end up leaving as a fan of Genlock. Mm -hmm. I think um, we've always sort of followed this golden rule, which is, make the kind of content that you'd want to watch. Because statistically speaking, there's gotta be other people out there with similar interests and likes that, that you have. And then at that point, you just have to hope that there's enough of them to sustain you continuing to do that. <laughs> and fortunately, that seemed to be the case for Rooster Teeth. Um, yeah, that's basically what it comes down to is like, Ruby is a cool concept. I'd watch a show like Ruby. Let's make that show. Like, it's, yeah, it's uh, it, it's one of our um, core values uh, for the company is be genuine, which means making things you want to uh, watch, basically. So we always ask ourselves when we're developing a new project or something is like, you know, is this something we would like um, to work on? One and, oh. and and I think I think the the benefit uh, that you see in the end product is. Everyone who works on it loves working on it because mm -hmm. they would watch it. So they relate to the characters. So when they're animating the character, they put a little, you know, something extra in it. Would you say it's made with love? <laughs> would you was, say love was, is a secret ingredient? I was getting around oh, to that. <laughs> that, that's, that's what Spoilers. it comes down to. But it, like, that's putting it, I think, too simply. Like, yeah, it, it's yeah. something much deeper than that Like that you get when you work on a show that you really uh, connect with and, uh, and, and love. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that was, uh, like you said, be genuine was one of our core values, but be purposeful was another one. And you think, you know, coming in every day and actually having this purpose, I want to... Animate how do you, how do you make it of, better? Yeah. yeah, how do you make it better? I want to make this many frames, and I want to make it better, and I want to do this. And for me, it's like, all right, I want to take the sound effect and, and take it even further. You know, maybe it sounds cool now, but maybe it could sound better. Um, <laughs> it's just a matter of coming in and, and thinking, how can I do this? How can I make this something that I would enjoy as 
yeah. as an audience member. That made me I, think about something where, like, you're thinking about, like, how to make a sound better. Sure. Another big part of your job is a director saying, that sound doesn't work. Can you do something that's, like, squeak, 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 squeak? Can you that's, find that he's, sound? He's quoting himself. Yeah. Just so you know. <laughs> he, he really likes to make the sound. <laughs> 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 thing. But, yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. I think, you know, you're you're working with a lot of interesting and awesome people, everybody who kind of brings something to the table. Um, and it's kind of funny because you're, you're in one hand, you're trying to make something that you would enjoy, but in the other hand, like Jordan's saying, is you're making something that a director has to approve and they have to enjoy it as well. So you're trying to en encompass all of this into that one perfect final vision. Which is another see. one of our core values. Be collaborative. Dang, man. We'll we're get hitting, to all of them. We're hitting sure. all of them today. <laughs> <Good> Lord. <laughs> RT core values. What's, what is interesting, though, is as the company's grown and as we have... Um, ventured into new like shows and, and ideas and things and you know, like uh, there was Rooster Teeth and then there was Achievement Hunter was kind of like the first sort of like branch off yeah it was um, it was like it was like films and video games were yeah. like the main things and like yeah. that's what Achievement Hunter came became um and so now actually because we we do so many different and diverse things we actually find that we have multiple different audiences like yeah. just for example like mm, there are a lot of people that come to Rooster Teeth for Achievement Hunter content and couldn't care less about Ruby. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I think our marketing team probably has some of the like the hardest job because they have to like this tweet has to cater to these people, and then yeah. the tweet that comes in an hour has to cater to those people. But if we do too many tweets in an hour, then people will unfollow us. And yeah. then it's like there's a lot of different audiences that you're trying to reach. And I think something that I believe in, I think a lot of people at Rooster Teeth believe in too, is like if you just try to chase the audience you will never you will never succeed. You can't chase after something and hope to capture it. You can't just be like, oh, the new Aladdin's coming out. People love live action genies. We gotta come up with something like that. Gotta make sure the genie flosses. <laughs> <laughs> Get them on the TikTok. Um, oh God. Yeah, no, oh. dab on them. No, so. Uh, <laughs> Take it easy there, Grandpa just, Miles. If you, if you chase that, people uh, will know when you're, when you're not being genuine and you'll uh, never catch up to it. How and, much and, do you wanna bet the genie flosses in this movie? You think Will Smith flosses in the movie? Hey, I watch Shazam and Shazam flosses. I'm gonna in the say, movie. I'm gonna go on record right now. I, I bet he flosses in the movie. I bet it's like background, but I bet he flosses. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> anyways, oh, boy. Um, at that point, because oh, we boy. have so many diverse audiences, like you can't, you can't make everybody happy all the time. So you just have to believe in what it is that you're yeah. doing and hope that other people believe in it too. Well, clearly you've, you've hit the target. I mean, if, if you think about entertainment companies today, especially those that, that, that kind of target that, that sci-fi kind of collector video game space. You can say nerd. They, okay. <laughs> Basically, you're Nerds have you inherited the earth. Yep. Uh, yes, we have. Introverts. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 they have a perfect place in, in, in any of the cons. So, like, the mega cons, the comic con, we just had mega con, comic con. But you guys started your own, yeah. right? <laughs> GTX. I mean, that's kind of like the next level of fandom. Could you talk a little bit about how that came about and maybe uh, what the experience is like for you folks on the inside? <laughs> RTX is wild. And we love <laughs> every one of you that come out to it. <laughs> um, I, think, I think the original idea came from there were a bunch of these like community pop-ups going around, not just the country, around the world. There was like... RVBTO. Yeah, RVBTO oh. was in wow. Toronto. There's RTUK, like... Like all these like meetups happening, and uh, you know I think the idea was to just have it be centrally located. So let's do uh, our own convention basically. And uh, the first one was like a test run. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in 2011. Yes. Uh, it was supposed to be 200 people. Uh, the ticketing website broke, so 500 tickets got sold. So the event had to qu uh, change very quickly from like a uh, intimate, like, uh, come to the studio, we'll give you a tour thing, to uh, there's a field next door, let's have a barbecue and do some other things. Um, I actually, like, this is 20, 2011, so I was just barely making RTAA uh, for not even a year yet, but um, I, got, I got a ticket. I was one of those 500 people and uh, drove out from... Uh, California to uh, to Texas uh, to go to the first RTX. That's where I first met you. Yeah. Yeah. I was all right. You were all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> Young uh, scrappy miles. <laughs> Thinner miles. <laughs> um, but at this point, yeah. Now we have uh, we host RTX uh, typically every summer at the Austin Convention Center. We have 
I don't know what the count is up to now, but last, we have thousands. Last year was 60,000? 60, 60,000 people attending. It's yeah. three days. Um, and, you know, we have uh, panels where we'll do, like, behind-the-scenes stuff with uh, members of our production teams. Uh, we'll have other people from the industry who we respect. We have, you know, a show floor where you can buy, you know, sweet graphic tees and, like, <laughs> cool sword props. At least I do. Um, <laughs> and, and, no, it's, it's really just, like, can, the idea was can we take this – online community that we have somehow managed to build and 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 let people experience that in real life. And I think one thing that's really cool about RTX is if you go to RTX, there's a good chance that you have at least one thing in common with everybody there, which is do you watch Rooster Teeth content? And although we are trying to branch out, we've started doing uh, our own animation festival mm -hmm. uh, these past couple of years, which has been going really, really well. We're now getting to do uh, uh, like premieres for things that you'll see on Adult Swim or Mondo. Um, and it really, it's just it, it, what I always really like about it is like people that are waiting in line for a panel or something can almost immediately strike up a conversation. And I've, I've heard a lot of people say like, oh, I made friends with these folks at RTX. Now, we're, now we keep in touch, even though we're on opposite ends of the earth and it's just it's cool to be able to put out any sort of positivity like that in today's world is something I think <laughs> you should be proud of so I think for me the thing that I I'm most excited about when RTX comes around is not only are you meeting people and making friends with you know other like-minded individuals that are kind of a part of the community but the staff is there I mean I walk around the show floor I mean I've met some of you there just at RTX, just by happenstance, you run into me, we start talking about this side or the other. And, you know, that's it's lasting, especially for, you know, industry professionals or soon-to-be industry professionals like yourselves, right? Like, you, you make these lasting friendships and relationships with people that inspire you and you learn from them and you ask them questions and maybe you, you get mentored by them or you become an intern or you get hired or whatever the case may be. I mean, you don't always have to make that your end goal. It's, it's, it's just forging that relationship because truth be told, I mean, I can only speak on behalf of games and like audio as a whole. The industry is so small. I mean, I'm sure I know someone that you guys and gals may be super hyped to meet and vice versa. Uh, it's just, you know, going to going to something like that for me has been so eye opening, especially because I, prior to Rooster Teeth, you know, I'd never really done anything like that. I'd never really been any major conventions. So yeah, I, I'm like thinking about it. It's like, I'm kind of getting choked up because it's just, it's so cool. It's just a, a great place to meet other people that like what you do. And from our point of view, it's for us to meet people like you and vice versa. Yeah. And I would imagine a big part of that attendance is comprised of content creators. Mm. Uh, I, would, I would also guess that a lot of folks are pitching shows. Is that the case? Uh, have you guys ever? <laughs> uh, was that a sore subject? Uh, so typically, no, we won't accept shows okay. getting pitched no. that come to us at RTX. Got it. Or, yeah, I always feel bad, too, because people will be like, hey, I wrote this really cool idea. Can I get your thoughts on it? And it's like, I legally cannot read that because right. I can't be accused of plagiarism, but Tumblr's a thing, yeah. uh -huh. and they love to give opinions. Right. <laughs> so, so would you say that all of your programming comes it, it, it comes about internally, or has it been anything that you've actually acquired from the outside that maybe had a buzz on Tumblr or somewhere else? <laughs> uh, it's a mix of both. I think uh, for animation specifically, it's definitely more internal. Um, These past few years, we've branched out a little bit. We've been working yeah. with... Um, some folks uh, to start working and developing a show called Spike Face. Um, and uh, I think it was last year we announced that we were going to try and start um, a more like collaborative like animation like pitch, so essentially reaching out to other content creators um, that do animation currently online um, and saying like, hey, if you want to come talk, like let's talk. Yeah. We, our, our, our Let's Play family well, I just said what it is. Uh, essentially, Achievement Hunters start off as just the Achievement Hunter guys playing games, and then they created what was the Let's Play family, which now we have Funhouse, Kind of Funny, and a bunch of other folks that essentially said, like, hey, we like the stuff that you do, you like the stuff that we do, let's maybe make some collaborative videos from time to time, and occasionally host one another's videos on each other's respective platforms. That's also turned into some collaborative series, like Funhouse and Arizona Circle, mm -hmm. uh, their sketch comedy show, uh, you know, written by uh, all of Funhouse, and then produced in Austin with uh, our live action team. Even, and even in animation, there was the, the yeah. sweet and short-lived yeah. sex, sex Swing, sex which swing. was a collaboration yeah. between oh, yeah. RT Animation <laughs> and Funhouse. Yeah. Rip, 
that deserves so much more love. I'll always go down saying that. <laughs> um, I mean, for me personally, just not being a writer, nobody really pitches shows to me, but I do get a lot of people asking about, you know, can I get a job or can I have, you know, hand you my resume? And it's like, cool, I really appreciate your enthusiasm. Here's my email, let's talk. It's not likely that I'm going to just offer you a job right then and there, I'm sorry. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing you should take away from that is when you go to events, any event, if you're in games and you go to GDC or if you are, you know, a Rich Teeth fan, you want to work at RT in the future or wherever you may go, um, don't look at it as an opportunity to get a job or pitch yourself. Look at it as an opportunity to make friends and meet people. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Speaking of that, uh, I would imagine that there are plenty of folks in this audience right now that will be looking, if not already looking, for employment in the industry. I would love to get each of your insights uh, about some of the things that you recommend them doing during that process, either what to bring, what to say, uh, what they should be doing before they start looking, any advice in that space? Oh, yeah. I mean, I... Uh, I, I look at a lot of reels, so I can kind of talk about this. Um, I would say uh, the first thing for animation especially, uh, we'll always look at the reel and we, not to put it too harshly, we kind of judge within the first 30 seconds or so uh, based on uh, the reel. Um, resume is important, experience is important, but like really like you can tell in those 30 seconds of work whether or not somebody is perfect for what you need them to do. Um, you know, if you know if they're green enough or uh, experienced enough. Um, so that's that's always the biggest thing I, I take a look at. Um, I look at like different types of animation. Like, do is there a lot of hand drawn stuff? Is there some puppet stuff? That's mostly what we deal deal with in in two D animation. Um, and uh, just you know, uh, kind of what are they doing different? You know, like how sound is their work basically. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if your music is too annoying, and then uh, that's just bad too. <laughs> um, on the writing front, spec scripts. If you're interested in writing, you should be writing right now. Uh, it sounds silly, but writing fan fiction is great because that's essentially a spec script. It really yeah. is. It's 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 fan fiction is is showing that you have an understanding of character and voice and tone. Um, then spec script is taking it a step further, making sure that you have an understanding of all of the all of those things as well as formatting, um, being able to keep things within a certain time limit or page count. Um, and really, that's the kind of stuff that I look at a lot. Um, at this point, our writing team has grown really, really large. And, and um, we've had the pleasure of working with some really wonderful people. Um, and for us, seeing as we are kind of a smaller studio and the way that our creative team works, we can't just hire a funny writer. We need to hire a writer that can maybe we can use on this show, and then maybe they can also use on this show, or at least use them as a reader on this other show. And so, specifically for Rooster Teeth, a lot of times we look for mainly people that can understand and identify something in the voice of someone else, not necessarily their own voice, and can mimic that and understand that. Yeah. Um, that was how I started writing for Rooster Teeth. Was that I wrote a Red versus Blue miniseries, and Bernie was like, "Oh, that's." Good church dialogue, cool. Um, and of course, nothing's ever going to be perfect right out the gate, but that spec scripts is a huge thing. That's a great, great kind of writing sample that you can submit. Yeah. I think, you know, it's a combination, actually, for me, it's a combination of both what Miles and Jordan are saying. Um, I get a lot of resumes and reels and stuff. I actually get more resumes than reels, which is a huge issue. Um, if you ever apply to work, for me, if you ever see my name okay. and you want to apply at a studio I'm at, if you don't send me a reel, uh, you are not, I'm not going to consider you for employment. Um, I don't care who you are. I don't care how many years of experience you have. Um, for me, it's just, it's very difficult. I have hundreds of people who apply whenever we have a position open. And I have to look to see if there's an attachment because I don't have the time or the mental capacity to sit there and wade through tons and tons and tons of emails of people who tell me that they make fat beats. <laughs> <laughs> well, they make fat beats? They do. Whoa, let's hire them. See, I'm bad at Jordan, I'm you're not helping. Hiring. <laughs> you're, not, you're not helping at all. Um, oh, so it doesn't happen. Listen, I mean, I, and there's a time and place for fat beats. Totally cool. Um, but for me, I work on, I mean, I work on Ruby. We work on Genlock. We work on Camp Camp. We have such a diverse series of shows 
that I need you to show me what you can do. And, you know, like Miles was saying, was if you're going to, if you want to apply for a, a company anywhere, you're in school now. Now is the best time. You don't have any other responsibilities well, outside of, you know, certain things, I suppose. But <laughs> you should be putting together your reels now. You have so many wonderful resources here. When I was here in 2008, they had, you know, all the different edit bays or sound bays. They had libraries, like all the libraries I could have uh, asked for back then. And I went and I recut a Halo, like I redesigned a Halo trailer. And it didn't sound great, but you know what? It was good enough for someone to be like, hey, this guy's okay, I guess. I mean, it worked out, right? <laughs> you but, are okay, I guess. I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. But I guess, I guess the point is, is get started now. Yeah. You're here, do it. You have instructors that can look over your stuff. Yeah. Uh, you have peers that can look over your stuff. Don't be afraid to ask questions and show things off. And for the love of God, make a reel, please. <laughs> like, I, I can't stress it enough. If you're, if you're going to work in this industry as a creative, you need to have a reel. There's just no two ways about it. One, yeah, la one mean, last. Oh, uh, do you have you have a great you know resource of every everyone around you to basically give give you critique you know, um, and you need to get used to criticism and you know knowing how to take criticism and uh, how to improve what you have. Um, you know, criticism should never be taken as an insult. It's it's a room for improvement kind of thing. Like yeah. here's it, here's what you have. It's pretty good. Here's how it can be better. Uh, here's what I'm missing kind of thing. Um, I have to criticize my animators every day, and I hate doing it, but you know, um, it's it's how we get to an end product. So, um, you know, having the access of everyone around you now, just show it off to everyone, get everyone's input. Um, you know, decide. You can also decide. You know, what you what you want to keep, what you want to take out, kind of stuff. Um, but you know, don't. Don't take it for granted that you have you have this resource. Yeah, and and finish what you start. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you need to be making things right now. Now's the time to make mistakes, and you're yeah. always going to make mistakes. But now you have the safety net. Now your your income doesn't depend on mm -hmm. making as few mistakes as possible. This is a time to be making as many mistakes as you can. Finish what you start. Give yourself deadlines, and know Don't that. Don't worry it's, about it being good. Yeah, know that it's, it's it ain't gonna be great, it's folks, good. right out the gate. Yeah. But know that when you're done with it and it is finished, yourself and maybe other people that you trust with it can look at it and go, okay, where did I make missteps? Yeah. Here's, How do I improve that Here's what's the working. next thing I do? Yeah. Yeah. Here's what's working, here's what's not working. Yeah. Here's where you need to work on some stuff and then you, you know what to do next. Yeah, take what you learned, apply yeah. it to your next thing and finish that too. Yeah. And be prepared to do that for the rest of your lives. Yeah. Yup. <laughs> God, if I could go back and rewrite early volumes of Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris, as someone who literally was in the seats that these folks occupy, yeah. uh, not, not that long ago. Come on, man. It, it was it, a long day. Is this room here when you were trying to be kind. a student? So if, if, you don't, if you don't mind sharing some of the things that maybe at the time you didn't realize were going to be those gems that kind of helped you maneuver maybe to your first positions in the industry, what would those be? Uh, okay. Well, I think I've said it a few times earlier, but I, I cannot stress this enough. I want you all to just take two seconds to look to your left and your right and look at all the people. Seriously, this is not BS. I'm being 100% serious. These are the people that you are going to consider your career professional friends from this point forward. Some of you are going to go on and do awesome things, and some of you are going to have some struggles and some hardships and a little bit of A, a little bit of B. But when I was here, the, the best thing that I did for myself was establish friendship with all sorts of different students and all sorts of different uh, courses. I had uh, Brian Riley, who actually works in our games department. I knew him when I was here. Um, a couple of my other buddies who are on tour or doing this, that, and the other, they all gave me opportunities. When I finished here, I worked at the Plaza Theater, which is not super far from here, because uh, a buddy of mine was the TD there. And he's like, hey, I know you're into audio and you need a gig. So he gave me a, you know, some low-level stuff to do, and I ended up doing front of house for a while. It was, it was awesome. So um, I think the number one thing would be network. And don't be a jerk. Don't be like a, like a, there are a lot of people here that you may think, oh, yeah, that person's unsavory, for lack of a better word. <laughs> um, I had a lot of those people. And you know what? None of them went on to do anything. They left school before it finished, or 
you know, they finished and they just kind of didn't want to pursue anything because no one wanted to work with them. So just be a good human being. Uh, I guess that's number two. So network and be a good human being. Those are like the two criteria for being at least somewhat successful. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I kind of, it kind of irks me now because we're in this interesting era and this kind of sounds like an old man thing to say, uh, where, I mean, even when I was here, we, were, we had our MacBook Pros. We were, you know, there are people who would just kind of sit and like watch YouTube videos or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're here at this school and you're trying to pursue this career. And yeah, you know, sometimes we have bad days, but you're here in each of your classes for such a short period of time that you need to make everything count every single day because there are pieces of knowledge that you're going to get that are going to become useful at some point. And they're going to be pieces of information that you may never use, right? I haven't soldered a cable in forever, but I knew how to do it. And when I needed to, it came in handy. So I think you need to make sure that you're making this time count because it's, it's, this is what's going to propel you into the future. So networking, being a good human, and just paying attention. So it's like the, the small, the three smallest things. You, you do those things and you're at least somewhat decent at your creative gig, someone will likely hire you and teach you how to be better at your gig. Yeah. It's, it's just, that's just the best way to explain it. That's great advice. Um, I believe we have some questions in the audience. Is that correct? Question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's question uh, time. Let's, let's take some questions. Da -da -da. Get a mic going around. Da -da -da. Just wave your hand. <laughs> Yeah. So um, what does the ideal pre-viz reel look like, and uh, what should I put on my reel? Oh, wait. Ah. That's a future question. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. All right. Do we want to answer that question? Um, should we answer well, that question? I, I, can, I can speak to some real stuff. Um, I always prefer, like, the best stuff at the beginning of the reel. Um, uh, uh, the, like, because, like I said, I, we judge pretty quickly on, on reels. Here's what I'm going to do. What are you going to I'm going to call an audible. I want you to okay. hang on to that question, and I want you to ask that question at a very future time when we <laughs> announce. Definitely nothing to do with the surprise that we're going to talk about here. Nothing to do with any surprises that we're going to share with you. <laughs> but if you happen to have any other pre-viz questions, hold please on to them. hold on to them for a future time. Like a future No spoilers. Future time. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll come back to you, I promise. All right. All right. Uh, can you guys share anything about the um, Transformers series you guys are making for Netflix? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I don't know if, what we're allowed to say. I don't, yeah, it's that's kind like, of a, it's really Machinima's thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's so. cool. It's, yeah. <laughs> it is very yeah, cool. I got applause for that one. <laughs> Woo. Look at that. Details forthcoming. Uh, and the, hey, I will say this, the director like, is super into Transformers and cares so much. Uh, we were having like, a very casual conversation with him one time, and we were referring to like, oh yeah, dude, I mean, robots are cool. And he goes, they're not robots, they're Transformers. <laughs> I was like, damn, son. I mean, true, but damn. That's awesome. <laughs> but he's not wrong. So there's a lot of passion behind the project. I can guarantee that. A question right here. Okay. Pop, 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 pop. Hi, I was wondering, um, one thing I've noticed is that there have been hints that you guys are using more motion capture when it comes to doing uh, some series. Like in Ruby, you guys would have Cinder walking and you would go through some of the action scenes. And I'm wondering, are you guys moving more towards um, motion capture for when it comes to your animated series? Or are you just sticking to having it to fill in the hard stuff? So it's funny. On it depends on what you consider the hard stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have always <laughs> utilized uh, motion capture animation. Monty Ohm was a motion capture wizard. Um, we used he it. He had a motion capture area in the old Congress office that was probably about the size of one of these tables. Yeah, <laughs> um, it was how his it was his preferred workflow. Um, and really what we actually use motion capture most for, because we've been using it since season eight of Red vs. Blue, and we use it in all of our 3D shows, um, except for Ruby Chibi. That would be wild. Big <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, head mode. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, oh honestly, the thing that, that uh, motion capture tends to help us the most with is conversation and like dialogue-based scenes. A lot of our action, we we can't fly through the air like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and though sometimes it does help, like RVB in particular, we sometimes bring in uh, some hand-to-hand uh, -hand specialists to like capture some of the more grounded realism um, that was in like the chorus trilogy and stuff. Um, 
really you, we like hand king a lot of those like super pose heavy fights and impossible fantastical moves and we utilize a lot of the uh, motion capture for hey we have five people in the scene they're having a conversation we just need a base level that then all of our very talented animators go in and make look a million times better yeah yeah as far as my understanding of it is uh, they use it as uh, groundwork basically yeah. um a lot of clean up to yeah clean up later it depends too on the show like in ruby a lot of times they rip out a ton of the data from the motion capture because there's again it's a lot more uh uh, pose based, a little closer to 2D than something like uh, Red versus Blue or uh, Genlock, even. Hmm. Great question, thank you. All right, we have an online question, please. <laughs> oh, cool. snap. In computer animation, um, oh. he wants to know what is the best place to network with different people? Oh, that's Can a good question. I mean, going to events like this is actually one yeah. a stellar way to do yeah. it. Conventions like, like RTX or, you know, just. Comic cons, film festivals, like are film great. festivals, yeah. Austin Film Festival is awesome. Go to where the people, the industry you want to work in, are yeah. meeting up. You know. Yeah. What uh, what was the the you said it was a grad or a student currently? A, yeah, current student for computer animation. Okay. Computer animation. Okay. Yeah, I know in all in, in Orlando when I was here there was a IGDA which was the uh, Game Developers Association. Yeah. I don't. No, yeah, Igda. I don't know if they're still here, but that was actually my jumping off point for networking. I just met a bunch of people there, and they're like, oh, yeah, we make games. And then I came back to Full Sail, actually, and I did, um, I did a couple of the capstone projects for a handful of teams before I took off to Austin. Um, so, yeah, finding those small groups. Also, Facebook is, is kind of, like, really awesome for that. <laughs> um, that and like keeping up with your grandma or whatever. <laughs> Evil for the world, but good for networking. Yeah. <laughs> hey man, you said it, not me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, there have been there have been so many uh, groups that have been popping up. Like I'm a part of a sound designers group with like like some of the biggest names that I've ever like uh, people that I'm just I fanboy over, I guess. That you know they just drop knowledge bombs on Facebook. I'm like, whoa, that's amazing. And then next thing you know, it like. You know, you get into another, a smaller group with them, and then they, you know, hit you up on Messenger or whatever. So, uh, TLDR, go to events and join Facebook groups. And, <laughs> and if you're still in school, uh, extracurricular clubs and things oh, like yeah. that. Because not only sure. are you going to get additional experience, but you're going to, again, network and make yeah. friends with people. I would not be here if I did not volunteer at the Texas Student oh, Television dude, Station. That's I, a, I just wouldn't. The, vo the volunteering? Bar none, the best thing I ever did for my career. A uh, real short story. Um, when I moved to Austin, uh, by the way, just so you know, if you pick up and move to another city, be prepared to, if you don't have a job lined up for you, be prepared to figure that whole thing out. Uh, I moved there. I didn't have a gig. I had a, a friend that lived there. We got an apartment together, and I worked at a restaurant for six months um, because it was something I did while I was here. Uh, and I went to every possible event that I could, meet up, whatever, for the Game Developers Association to network. Uh, one of the guys there that was holding the whole thing, he did a micro talk, was something similar to this with uh, industry professionals. And because I had my TABC, which is the Texas Alcohol and Beer Certification, I can serve alcohol. He's like, hey, serve beer at this event. If you do it, I'll give you one minute on stage to talk in front of this 200 people uh, auditorium. Wow. So I did that. I got up on stage after that whole thing was done. And I just told everybody my story. And I had one person that came up to me uh, I'll never forget it. And she said, you have an interesting story. You seem like a good human being. Do you have a resume? I'd like to talk to you. And, and from then on, I, I've tried to offer as much advice to everybody in the realm of please volunteer. Yeah. yeah. Please just do it. Be a part of those things because people appreciate that. The one thing that I also think people overlook a lot too is a lot of people think networking is meeting someone who's in the industry and getting mm -hmm. to know them and befriending them. Mm -hmm. Don't forget about people that aren't yet yeah, in the 100%. industry. Because you might have somebody who is really looking to be a, a cinematographer and they are just looking for a project to work on. And if they come in contact with someone who's like, I have this script that I've workshopped a few times. I think it's pretty good. I just need somebody to help me shoot this thing. And then you meet someone who's like, well, I'm just trying to direct it. I'm just looking for a project that I believe in. Like Finding other people people who are trying to get in meet up and then make the thing and then maybe someone might like the thing and then you'll all get into the industry who knows yeah. but like do not forget that other people who aren't in it can help you too yep we have a question right here okay hi so um i'm a recent graduate from computer animation and i'm sorry if this is a little bit uh, uh 
like close to what y'all have already talked about, but like, um, you know, how, uh, what advice do you have for uh, navigating and not getting discouraged with um, specifically like online application? Like, mm. like when I applied to Rooster Teeth uh, a little while back, uh, you know, it's that, you know, you know, uh, generic job website. How do you stand out in those type of situations when it's just name, resume, inserted as a PDF? Okay. Yeah. Add to your website here. Well, I, I definitely, I can help you out with this one. Um, so going back to the thing I mentioned earlier about having a real, you said you do 3D animation, is that correct? Yeah, I'm a rigger actually. Oh, okay, cool, okay. cool, cool, cool. Um, so I don't know anything about that, <laughs> full disclosure here. But for me, the thing is, is, and I totally get that. When I was here, I kid you not, I tried to apply to EA Tiburon like out, just after I finished school, and I never heard back from them ever again. And I totally, it's totally cool, I get it. It's cool. I'm not, I'm not resentful at all. <laughs> um, you don't sound it, so. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but um, I learned a very valuable lesson. My, my stepmom, bless her heart, she was like, she's like, oh, honey, you need to go there and give them this, that. And I'm like, I don't think they want me to come near their building. <laughs> so it, my advice to you is, and it's really, really hard, because I, I get discouraged, too. I get, you know, it really breaks my heart when, like, I... I've applied for stuff in the past and I haven't heard anything or whatever. Um, it's one thing to follow up. It's another thing to be obsessive. So first one is if you don't hear anything in a week or two, just try and send a follow-up email. Um, sometimes it's helpful to go to LinkedIn and look for the recruiter at a company and just be like, hey, hi, I'm so-and-so. I applied for this thing. I haven't heard anything back. I don't want to, you know, I don't mean to pester. Be as like humble as you can about it. Um, but I was just wondering if this position was still open or if I'd be considered. Sometimes people won't answer you, sometimes they won't. If they don't do you the courtesy of getting back to you, it's kind of like, all right, this one's kind of hard too because it's like a cross between being too busy or what have you and there should be that courtesy there. But uh, if you could take anything away from this, it's, it's gonna happen and you just cannot let it get you down. Uh, you just gotta keep, keep going and apply maybe once or twice to a company. Don't apply like 17 times and if you apply at Rooster Teeth, oh yeah, uh, pro tip, just for everybody here, if you apply at Rooster Teeth, do not apply for seven different jobs. <laughs> Please don't do that. Like, if you want to apply to work in my department, and then you apply to work as, like, a writer and then achievement hunter, I mean, like, I don't know why. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> what do you want with your life? I don't get it. Yeah, that, that screams, I just want to work at Rooster Teeth. That's it. And yeah. you, like, it's okay to say, like, I think it'd be cool to work at, like, Disney or something like that. Like, when I was getting out of college, I applied for internships at Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network. I made it to the second round of interviews for both, and then I got the door shut on me at both, and I was super bummed because I always wanted to work for both of those places, and then I went, well, I guess I'll apply to this Rooster Teeth thing. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, don't, don't just set out to work someplace, set out to do something you are passionate about, yeah, yeah. and then when you, like, it sucks, but you just have to keep getting back up and keep trying again because um, I hate to say you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, but... <laughs> take it easy there, Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> one, one, of the, one of the ways you can also, also kind of stand out, um, and it kind of marries what Miles is talking about. So basically, my resume and reel was RTAA. Like, it just, happened, it just happened to work out that way. I wanted to make an animation. I didn't have a microphone to record audio. I took audio podcast. It turned into this whole other show. Um, and, you know... It showcased what I can do. I was clearly passionate about it. There was, you know, all the all the beats were hit, and so they're like, "Whoa, cool! We can work with this person. They know what they're doing." Um, there's uh, also times in 2D we've had to hire rigging artists before, um, and we need to know that they understand the complexities of a rig and the program. Uh, so something something a little extra you could do is maybe you know do your best rigging job on a, a really complicated character, show, show off what it can do. And like, so it makes somebody in the animation department or like the modeling department go, wow, that's cool. Yeah. Like we need this person. Yeah. Uh, something like that I think goes a long way. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to show a little something extra that uh, you know maybe other people aren't aren't doing. Yes, yeah, so if you if you can only submit like a PDF resume, maybe in that resume include a link to a video that shows that. Yeah. Awesome. I think. So we have one, we have time for one last question. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, given that it's a huge problem in the entertainment 
industry, animation specifically, how does Rooster Teeth deal with crunch time? Still Ooh. working on it for sure. Oh yeah. boy. <laughs> and, and it's yeah. like, it's, it's, it's a harsh truth. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, we have had good years, we've had very, very bad years, and nobody ever feels good about the bad years. Um, I think it's interesting to sometimes think about the fact that the company was founded by some really great and insightful and influential people, but none of them also have ever ran an animation mm -hmm. studio before. And so a lot of, as we've been making things, we've been having to learn how to kind of grow up and be an animation studio. It was really tough in the early days because the, before the animation department was an official department, um, we were just kind of like the nerds in the garage that made stuff. <laughs> and it would suck when like, hey, we finished a project and it's like, all right, we have to let go of all these contractors because we can't, we can't afford to pay you on, we, we, like we don't have another thing for you to work on. Um, and as we've grown and we've been able to keep a steady flow of work, it's been really, really nice to try and hold on to as many people as possible. Um, but there's still gonna be times where like, it don't work out due to one thing or another. Um, it's tough, and it is something that is throughout the whole industry, and I think everybody needs to get better, yeah. at, including the, Rooster Teeth. The, yeah, I think you know the, the problem areas are kind of easy to identify. You know, When you have a pipeline, there's parts where a pipeline gets slowed down. The deadline does not change given that. So the sooner you can get something down to the next part of the pipeline, the better off everyone will be. Um, and that starts from the very beginning, from writing the storyboards, you know, getting it to the animator as soon, soon as possible so that audio can touch it as soon as possible, so compositing can touch it as soon as possible, um, you know, without rushing it. So it takes, it, it takes, you know, it takes compromise, it takes uh, uh, decisiveness, um, you know, and that's, I think, something, you know, Miles said we're still working on, um, you know, learn by doing, I guess. Yeah. So um, we're, def we're definitely, I think, in the future heading on the, on the right path. Yeah, I think um, it, it requires crystal, crystal clear and honest communication between all parties. And that's not just in like the animation department yeah. and in that animation pipeline. It requires tons of great communication with our accounting department. Yeah. We need to know like, hey, are we still on budget? Have we gone over budget? Like, you need to give us a forecast right now so we know what we need to do to make sure that this thing's going to be okay. Some, sometimes it's programming. It's like, oh, you need you need this series premiering here. Well, then we need to start it at this date. Yeah, you know, and then, this is how much runway we need. It, and it also means doing the scary thing, which is sometimes saying no. Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. Because if you if someone comes to you with a seemingly impossible task and you're a people people pleaser, or maybe sometimes it's scary, maybe you're a new employee and you don't want to be the one to say no. You want to try and show off how great you are. You have to be careful because if you set a bar at a certain level, mm -hmm. the people above you will remember that. Yeah. And if you set it way too high early on, it's going to set unrealistic expectations. So if someone comes to you and says, I need you to do this, and you don't think that's possible, you have to say it, because then that person can go talk to their producer, who can then maybe go talk to a showrunner or something like that, and then it lets them know, oh, damn, then we have a problem, and we need to solve it now. Yeah. Um, it's a tough question, yeah. and I think <laughs> the, the, first, the first studio that finds that perfect answer, they're gonna make a lot of great stuff. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Miles, Jordan, Chris, thank you so much for all of the amazing input, advice, insight. And please join me in thanking our guests. Thank you so much. Now.